Okay, we are going to get started. Perhaps before we do, I could ask everyone here in the room if your cell phones are on, perhaps turn them off or set them to vibrate, something that's not gonna make a lot of noise. <coughs> Thanks everyone for getting here today. Um, welcome to the American Wood Council and Rethink Woods Urban Sustainability Rural Prosperity Public Policy Panel Discussion. I am Robert Glowinski, President and CEO of the American Wood Council, and I'll be your moderator today. The American Wood Council is the National Trade Association for Wood Products, representing over 75% of an industry that provides approximately 400,000 men and women in the United States with family wage jobs. AWC members make products that are essential to everyday life from a renewable resource that absorbs and sequesters carbon, removing this contributor to greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. Our staff experts develop state-of-the-art engineering data technology and standards for wood products to assure their safe, efficient design, as well as provide information on wood design, green building, and environmental regulations. Rethink Wood is the other primary sponsor of today's important policy discussion panel. Rethink was formed to promote wood products marketing and communications in a focused and strategic messaging program to encourage a rethinking of wood use and enhance an awareness of wood's benefits particularly in the context of building with wood in mid-rise and non-residential applications. The Rethink Wood effort is designed to support and amplify a range of wood products organizations that are delivering services to architects and engineers. Rethink Wood is not a brand or an organization. It is simply a broad-based messaging and communications platform translating the value proposition for wood products in multifamily and non-residential applications. AWC and Rethink Wood Together are facilitating this policy discussion during National Forest Products Week, as designated by the President of the United States, to allow the U.S. Department of Agriculture and others to recognize the integral role forest products play in our everyday lives. Today, the policy panel we have assembled will share with you their views on the merits of modern mass timber construction, the carbon benefits provided by these extremely green buildings, and the positive economic impacts they generate. You will hear perspectives from U.S. Forest Chief Tom Tidwell, esteemed architect Michael Green, renowned environmental science scientist Dr. Jim Boyer, and Kat Sims, Vice President of Government Affairs for Plum Creek, a wood products manufacturing and landowning company. Uh, you may have noticed here today the camera in the room. Uh, today's discussion is also being broadcast live via the internet to participants across the country who are unable to be with us today in the room. We hope this discussion will lead to some new insights and understanding for you and those watching remotely that can be integrated into designing buildings and planning communities. Uh, before we dive in, I'd like to introduce two of our industry partners for some brief remarks. First is Steve Lovett. Steve has 35 years experience with the forest products industry and is the CEO of the Softwood Lumber Board. The Softwood Lumber Board is an industry-funded initiative established to promote the benefits and uses of softwood lumber products in outdoor residential and non-residential construction. As you will hear, the Softwood Lumber Board partnered with the Binational Softwood Lumber Council and the U.S. Department of Agriculture on the U.S. Tallwood Building Prize Competition. Steve. Thanks very much, Bob. It says box water is better, put out by the Paperboard Packaging Council and other <laughs> forest products. Um, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, in these opening remarks, I'll try to frame up a little bit, I think, some of the themes that you'll hear today. I represent the Softwood Lumber Board, as Bob said, an industry-funded checkoff that invests in research and promotion of innovative wood building products and systems. We have made significant investments in research to ensure the safety of tall wood buildings and support some of the organizations you're going to hear from today. We are especially grateful for our strong partnership with USDA and with the Forest Service and are delighted that the Chief is here today with us. Thank you, Chief. Here we go. The latest IPCC fifth assessment report details how close we are to a turning point in the Earth's climate system and confirms the necessity for immediate and sustained action on climate change. 
One way to do that is to reduce and ultimately phase out the CO2 emissions produced by the building sector by transforming the way buildings are designed, built, and operated, in, in essence, changing the way America builds. A recent Yale study shows that sustainable management of wood resources can main, by, maintain biodiversity and carbon storage capacity of forests while reducing global CO2 emissions, emissions by up to 31 percent. Organizations that have not been big champions of wood in the past now share this vision of wood as a truly green building material. The blog post from the U.S. Green Building Council, the folks behind LEED, promotes the benefits and use of wood from certified forests. Architects are some of the biggest promoters of these ideas, and you'll hear from Michael Green, a leading architect in the area, in a few minutes. We're delighted that Michael is here. He's a real rock star among architects and, and, and a great champion of, of, uh, of what we're working on. The Softwood Lumber Board efforts in tall wood began with a timber tower research project conducted by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And I, I want to say this building was not built. It's a feasibility study. But the goal of the project was to develop, to develop a structural system for tall buildings that uses mass timber as the main structural material and, and minimizes the embodied carbon footprint of the building. The structural solution was benchmarked against an existing concrete structure, the DeWitt Chestnut Apartments in Chicago a revolutionary structural solution when it was designed by, by SOM in 1965. The 400-foot-tall, 42-story building <clears throat> documented in a 72-page report demonstrates the technical feasibility of meeting architectural, structural, interior, and building service requirements. Systems were developed by SOM with considerations of constructability, cost, and safety related to to seismic, wind, and fire protection in mind. The new prototype is a hybrid system. This is back on the SOM slide. The new hy hybrid is a prototype system that would reduce the carbon footprint of the building by 60 to 75 percent when compared to the concrete benchmark. The next step on this journey towards tall wood was the SLB's partnership with USDA on the U.S. Tallwood Building Prize Competition. The shared goal of USDA and the industry is to change how America builds. Agricultural Secretary Vilsack and SLB Chairman Mark Brinkmeyer announced the winners of the competition over a, just over a month ago in New York City. The first winner is, a fra is the Framework Project in Portland, Oregon, backed by the Beneficial Bank Corporation. The co-winner in the competition uh, was the New York Project, which is a family affair with three different families representing the ownership group led by Spiritos Development. This is right downtown in New York City on 18th Street on the west side, uh, right next to the High Line. Another, prize, uh, another entry in the prize com competition was Carbon 12, also in Portland, Oregon. Uh, they didn't win, but this one will be out of the ground within six months. The SLB has, however, supported research for this project, which will become part of the public domain to help reduce early adopter costs and facilitate the development of, an ad of additional tall wood buildings. Heinz Corporation is a privately owned global real estate investment firm founded in 1957 with locations in 100 185 cities in 19 countries. The T3 in Minneapolis is Heinz's first wood project and was an entry in the Tallwood Building Prize competition. However, as they fur further explored the potential of this material, Heinz decided to decline funding under the competition. The reason? Heinz see the, sees the T3 concept as a competitive advantage and has added it as part of their overall proprietary product offerings. Anything that we do is part of the public domain. They wanted to keep this one private and the second T3 is planned for Atlanta in the near future. It's not only the environmental and structural benefits of wood, but also its beauty that makes it a very attractive product for taller buildings. As the market considers building taller with wood, the use of engineered mass timber products, systems, products and systems is gaining popularity with architects and engineers in North, across North America. The most well-known of the products is cross-laminated timber, 
which, is typically, which typically consists of three, five, or seven layers of dimension lumber oriented at right angles to one another and then glued to form structural panels with exceptional strength, dimensional stability, and rigidity. And there are two manufacturers in Canada <coughs> at this time and two more than are, that are in the early stages of operation in the United States. One of the most promising mass timber products for the lumber industry uh, is nail laminated, nail laminated timber. And while it has been used in both buildings and bridges for almost 100 years, no resources have been dedicated to better understanding its structural and architectural benefits. And so the Softwood Lumber Board will invest in testing and, and the development of practical guides for architects and engineers as well as suppliers of nail laminated timber. Pictured, pictured in this slide is the mock-up of the system proposed for what will be one of the tallest wood buildings in the world. <clears throat> Note the, beam, the beams have been engineered out of this. It's just the, the, uh, the uprights and the floor system with, with no underneath supporting beams. Uh, this, is, this is quite a breakthrough development. Uh, soon to be constructed at the University of British Columbia, this, this student residence building will stand 174 feet. Uh, construction of the 18-story mass timber structure will begin later this fall, and the building is set to open in September of 2017. So why does the industry wish to support the development of tall wood? The opportunity to use wood in construction is greater when we go taller, but not too tall. More than 75% of buildings in the United States are 10 stories or less, making this a, real, a realistic opportunity uh, for development. And so to summarize, our goal is to change the way America builds. In a climate change world, changing how America builds will strengthen our economy, create rural jobs, and most importantly, make a positive contribution to protecting the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I would uh, next like to introduce uh, Jennifer Cover, Executive Director of Woodworks. Woodworks is a national industry program that has a team of experts providing the building design community with technical support for the design and construction of non-residential and multifamily wood buildings. Jennifer is a licensed professional engineer who has been with Woodworks since its inception. She has also taught timber design as an adjunct professor for eight years at the University of California, San Diego. Jennifer. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon. As Bob said, uh, Woodworks is a nonprofit program that is dedicated to provide uh, technical support to architects, engineers, and developers that are trying to design wood structures. And we do this at no cost. We are staffed with um, architects and engineers ourselves, and this allows us to educate people peer to peer. We have staff throughout the US who are available regionally to provide, again, that one on one assistance with an architect or engineer who is trying to make their way. Uh, through the design process and understand where wood can be used in commercial and multifamily projects. We also have a core technical group that can field the little more difficult questions that might take more time to work through to allow our field staff to um, continue to move forward on various projects with folks. And so between the two groups, we are able to really service the entire U.S. and answer pretty much any question related to wood design. We have a number of different project support resources that are available. We provide educational assistance in large group formats, such as our all-day events, our wood solution fairs. These are, uh, tend to be about five tracks. Architects and engineers can pick the area of education that they're most interested in. And as part of that, they receive continuing education units for the entire day for the education that they receive. Additionally, we provide um, smaller groups, uh, lunch seminars, will come into an individual office if they've got questions or concerns, and we can educate on any particular topic that might be of interest to that specific office. Additionally, we have online resources. We have a heights and areas calculator and a carbon calculator, so uh, we have a number of different methodologies to get out to people uh, information about wood design and how to design properly with these structures. 
This year alone, we have reached, um, since January, 31,000 practitioner education hours is what we've awarded. So that's the number of people that we have actually provided education on how to design wood structures. Uh, this week, we have coming up on Thursday, one of the projects that Steve mentioned in his introduction there, the T3 Heinz building. We're going to have a webinar on that on Thursday. And the registration is already at 1100. Uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely jump on our website and register for it. We're going to have the engineer on that project talking about um, that project that just broke ground. And it's a uh, very innovative seven-story mass timber office structure. So it should be a good, a good webinar. And we are having a significant impact. Uh, what we're seeing is that in addition to providing the education through our ability to provide the one-on-one -on -one assistance, uh, this year alone, we have provided help on over 330 projects, and this is in the material decision-making phase of the project. We're able to come in and help people understand where wood can be used. So our staff of about 24 people, and we've got about 10 in the field, we're able to help on 330 projects. And what I think is really exciting is that it's definitely, um, you can see there in this chart, it's an upward trajectory that we are, we're on right now with how we're providing assistance. And really this is fueled by the excitement of the architects and the engineers. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are very excited about the use of wood, the environmental benefits that it provides. And we're sort of riding that wave and helping them understand how to do it. So once they get excited about using the material, we're able to come in and show them how they can actually apply it on a real project. Uh, you're going to be hearing from Michael in a few minutes here, and I think after you hear from him, from him you'll understand what we're seeing in the field, um, and it's, the excitement is, is really neat. Um, we do really firmly believe that you know, wood is how we are going to be able to grow sustainably as a community, and I think um, being able to help people see how they can do that is really important. And all of this that we do, again, we're nonprofit, so we don't sell anything. Um, so pretty much how we are able to provide these services is through the support of the USDA Forest Service, the SLB, uh, NRCAN, and FII. So I just want to thank our funders for making um, the services that we provide out to the design community um, available to those folks. So thank you very much. And our project assistance help desk is there, as well as our website. So if you're interested in more information on Woodworks, you can reach us there. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Steve. Thank you again. Um, exciting times. Uh, we'll move now on to our panelists. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, so we'll uh, hold questions until then. But first up, I'd like to introduce U.S. Forest Service Chief Tom Tidwell. Chief Tidwell has spent 38 years in the Forest Service, serving in a variety of positions at all levels of the agency. He was named chief in 2009. Under his leadership, the Forest Service is restoring healthy, resilient forest ecosystems, systems that deliver the many benefits that Americans get from their forests and wildlands, including plentiful supplies of clean water, abundant habitat for wildlife and fish, renewable supplies of wood energy, and more. So please welcome Chief Tidwell. Well, thank you. And first of all, welcome to National Forest Products Week. You know, it's something we've been celebrating. Yeah, let's have a little applause for National Forest Products Week. You know, we've been celebrating this week since 1960, and it always occurs the third week in October. But I think it's important that we take a few moments to really think about why. Why do we have a National Forest Products Week? And why is it important for us to celebrate this concept of forest products? Forest products. The majority of these products that we use, all of us use every day, almost throughout all aspects of our life, the majority of them come from private land. Because that's where the majority of our forested landscapes are, and they always have been. Also, our public lands, our state lands, and our tribal lands. But it's essential for us, I think, to understand the importance of forests and why it's essential that we have a robust economy around the use of forest products, if for no other reason, so that we can maintain forests, not only for this generation, but for future generations. You know, I would encourage everyone to um, pick up a copy of the President's Proclamation on the National Forest Products Week. It was just issued this week. And it talks about this connection the connection between forest products 
and how it adds to our lives, adds to the quality of our lives, but also it makes that connection to having healthy forests. Because healthy forests are essential for strong economies, for our quality of life, and not only for this generation, but future generations. You know, we use so many different forest products every day that I'm not sure everyone you know, even knows. For instance, napkins, the paper that I'm reading from today, these are the obvious ones, things like um, envelopes and stamps, wrappings on food, that thin piece of tissue paper on that new pair of socks. These are the obvious things, along with so many of our homes, the majority of our homes are, are built out of wood. But there's things like the cellulose gum that might have been in your toothpaste, or it might have been the compounds from trees that are in shampoo or medicine. These are other things that we get from our forest products. Another key one that 60% of Americans rely on, it's water. And it's clean water that comes from our forested landscapes. It's interesting that today more and more people understand this connection, that if you want clean water, you want to have a healthy forest because it's essential to be able to provide that. And 60% of Americans um, get their fresh water from the, from the United States from our forested landscapes. Another product that comes off of forests is more and more, um, especially rural communities, are using it for energy. You know, I was, um, I was surprised to find out that 33% of all the school children in Vermont attend a school heated by wood. And then today, there's dozens of hospitals across the country that's also using wood. And this is wood, the small diameter, the residual material that's a byproduct from managing our forests for forest health. It's another opportunity for us to be able to make use, economic use, of this material that needs to be removed to be able for us to sustain healthy forests in this country. You know, so I'm proud that the Forest Service and USDA plays a key role in not only helping people to understand the benefits of forest products, but so that they understand that connection to the healthy forests that we all rely on. Because it's those overall benefits that are essential to us. And it's not just the products, but it's those products that ensure that we continue to have the clean water, the clean air, the biodiversity, the wildlife and fisheries habitat, the recreational settings, and a tremendous amount of economic activity that's produced by maintaining and restoring our forests in this country. You know, with the Forest Service, we have a somewhat simple mission, and it's to sustain the health and diversity and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. Now, it may be simple, but from my view, it's quite a tall order. But when I think about this week and the importance for the America to understand the benefits of forest products, they also need to understand that connection. Because if we're going to meet the needs of not only the present generations, but future generations, we also need to understand it's essential that we understand the benefits that come from our forests and that connection that forest products provide. Because without the economic activity, we definitely would not have anywhere near the acreage of private forested lands. And when it comes to our public forest lands, the national forests, we would not have the means to be able to maintain and restore these forests. Today, we are faced with many challenges in our national forests to be able to deal with insect and disease outbreaks, to deal with the wildfires that are occurring, to deal with the impacts from windstorms and floods. And it's essential that we have the means to be able to restore these forests. And in many cases, it's to remove excess biomass, some that exists from our past uh, wildfire suppression practices. But the majority of it's, it's there is because of our changing climate. And to understand that we need to manage our forests differently today than what we've done in the past if we're going to ensure that we're going to provide that same mix of benefits that we all at times take for granted today, but to ensure that future generations will also be able to enjoy that same mix of benefits. 
And when I talk about the traditional forest products, it's also essential for us to talk about how we're working to expand traditional markets, but also create new markets. We're doing work with nanocellulosic technology with the hope to be able to be able to use wood in many different ways, everything from helping to strengthen uh, concrete to things like someday using nanocellulosic products in our cars. It is stronger than steel and it's much lighter. And to imagine what we could be doing with a product like that it would help us to be able to move forward, maintain our forests, but also provide another key use of a product uh, that we haven't been able to um, really make full use of in the past. I also want to talk a little bit about cross-laminated timbers. And it's been mentioned when we talk about this effort to move into commercial building with wood. Europe has been there for years. But here in the United States, we pretty much stayed below f um, four stories for the most part. But with this product, uh, cross-laminated uh, timber that was actually designed in Europe, and then we've been working with it here in our forest products lab to be able to help with the development of that, it's a product that we can use the small diameter material that needs to come off of so many of our forests where we need to do our thinning. But we, it produces a product that can be used in these tall buildings. So it's one of the reasons we want to promote the use of wood and not just in residential homes, but also in commercial buildings because it's another potential market that can make a significant difference to maintain and restore our nation's forests. It's already been, you know, Steve mentioned the competition that we're proud to be part of that. Secretary Vilsack, he led out on that, seeing that this was an opportunity to be part of a competition to promote the use of, of wood and tall buildings. And there is nothing better than having an example. It's great to be able to, to talk about it. It's great to be able to see the pictures. It's great to be able to see the designs. But when you can take people in to a tall wood building and have the engineers and the architects talk about the benefits, and not only the benefits about the amount of carbon that's sequestered, the amount of less energy that was used to be able to build this building, but to talk about the beauty, the strength, and how great it is to work and live in wood buildings. So I, we're excited to be part of it. It's great to be able to see that we're moving forward with the, um, the, the building both in New York and also in, the, in Portland, Oregon. And I'm also proud that uh, USDA, it was our rural uh, development that provided a million dollars as part of the competition, along with a $2 million prize that was provided by the Softwood Lumber Board and the Bi Binational Softwood Lumber Council. And so when I think about that $3 million investment, and I think about what it could produce, not only in the near term, but in the future, I think it was an incredible, incredible buy for us to be able to be part of this competition to be able to make a minimum investment that's going to make great rewards, pay off great rewards for our future generations. I use this just as one of the many examples, and whether it's across laminated timber or other forms of mass timber use, it's just a, another idea that's so essential for America to understand. In some ways, green uh, when wood, when it comes to building, wood's gotten somewhat of a bad rap especially when it comes to sustainability. And when I think about it, it's the most green building material we have. It definitely takes a significantly less um, energy to produce than concrete and steel. And if we can then find more ways to be able to use this, it not only will help us to restore and maintain our, our forests, it'll also increase the amount of carbon that's sequestered in, in the wood products, but it also helps us to reduce the reliance on these high energy construction uh, uh, facilities. So with that, it's great to be here to be part of this week. And I once again, I would encourage everyone to take the time and read the president's proclamation. I think that in itself tells us all how important it is for us to be able to understand the benefits of forest products and why it's essential that we understand that connection to be able to have healthy forests in this country. Thank you.
Thank you, Chief Tidwell. Next up uh, is Michael Green, Principal Architect with Michael Green Architecture. Michael's well known for his research, leadership, and advocacy in promoting the use of wood in the built environment. Michael is the author of The Case for Tall Wood Buildings, which introduces wood as a major opportunity for systematic change in the building industry. Some of you may have seen Michael's TED Talk on why we should build wooden skyscrapers. We're excited to have him here today. Please welcome Michael Green. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to switch over the PowerPoint here. So um, I'm going to start with this slide, um, the creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. And I think that is a theme that's going to be uh, throughout a lot of the way we um, each speak tonight. Um, it's a, I think the competition that the USDA and the uh, Southwood Lumber uh, Council put together to encourage these tall wood buildings is really just an acorn. It's the first seed that gets planted that begins an idea that propagates uh, taller and more urban wood buildings, I think, all over America and all over the world. And I think more and more, as an architect, I realize that my practice is about that. We're in the seed planting business as much as anything in creating sort of new ideas. And so I'm going to play this little video here um, for a moment. And it's a, as it comes out of the ground here, you're going to see a building that hopefully you all recognize. And it's a building that we um, took the uh, effort together with Equilibrium, who are engineers we work with, to try to understand whether this building could have been built entirely in wood. And when we started the exercise, we weren't sure what would happen. Um, but as we engineered it, and over time, we came to realize that indeed, you could have built the Empire State Building in wood. Something that very few people can really wrap their hands or heads around is the idea that this material has such strength and such capacity as to be able to build something 102 stories tall. But indeed it can, and I think it's um, an interesting exercise not so much because we will, but because it gives us the chance to understand what we might be able to do um, with wood products at a lower height. And so it's, it, it's really the seed. It's the beginning of this idea of what we're starting to call tall wood and what we call urban wood, which is buildings not even necessarily super tall, but bringing wood products into the urban environment. And so, of course, the question that many of our ask us is why? And why, is, why do we need to change the way we build fundamentally as, as, uh, as a, a nation is because we need to reduce energy use in our buildings, we need to reduce our CO2 emissions in our buildings, we need to find ways to store carbon dioxide to address climate change, and we need to move to more renewable building materials. And of course, we're all here to say that wood does all four of those things, unlike almost any other building material we can build with. Wood provides this beautiful answer and in fact, when you look at the metrics of comparing steel, wood, and concrete, the primary building materials for structures, um, on every single level that we look at it, wood is the, the best choice for us as builders. But it means we also need to understand some other important things as, as we start to build these, these new um, incredible structures. And one is that they're safe, of course. They must be safe. And our building codes are always there to address that. They have to be durable and they have to be healthy and they have to be sustainable. And when we talk about sustainable, that also means they have to be from certified, well-managed forestry practices that ensure that we source our products from um, the practices that are prevalent here in America, prevalent in North America and, and in Europe, but not prevalent all over the world for, for really making sure we, we manage forests properly. So code is the challenge. And, and the code is the, a challenge for us as designers because these ideas are brand new. Now, if you don't know that fleur-de-lis symbol up there, that is the symbol of the province of Quebec who have just changed their building code to allow 12-story tall wood buildings right here in North America. And just last week, I got a call from somebody in Montreal, a developer, on, that's already got one 10-story going up and now wants to do a 12-story. This is happening. These ideas of bigger buildings are happening, but the building code is one of the big challenges for us. And here in America, we remain with many codes that sort of stifle us at five stories. And that's true really all over the world, but really the question is why are there any height limits? To me as an architect, there are no height limits on steel, no height limits on, on um, concrete. And if my imagination and our engineers can prove these things are safe, why are we not able to make sure that wood products can be used in these new ways in taller and taller buildings, and this is where we're going. There's steps to get there, but this is where we're going to be going. 
So how is, of course, innovation, which means in the building sciences and forest sciences and engineering and design and wood product um, advancements, um, which are starting to happen so that we change this menu. Ultimately, for a century, we've been building um, with steel and concrete. I've got a lot of competition from this slider net set. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear that on the web. web. Um, but, um, but we're moving towards what we call these advanced wood products. So you've heard about CLT. There's others, um, these massive products, sheet goods made out of small trees glued together to make giant trees. And CLT, these mass timber panels, really open up the spectrum of new building opportunities for us, um, but it's gonna require education. So programs like Woodworks are fundamental to the success of bringing architects and engineers into the mix to understand how to do these new buildings. But also more than that, I think it's about explaining forestry, explaining it to our kids, starting in elementary school, bringing the conversation about where, just like we're starting to understand where our food products come from, understanding where our building products come from, that a healthy, lifestyle is not just about what you eat, but it's about where you live and being surrounded by the products from the forest is part of that solution to a healthier lifestyle. We need demonstration project projects and that's what the USDA's grant is about and we need to speed up this code evolution because these ideas are here, they're already starting to happen around the world as you'll see in a minute, I'm gonna show you some examples, um, but it means our codes have to catch up um, and it's, a, it's an important and complicated step to bring our codes up into alignment with products that we truthfully never imagined would be here before, and now we're gonna be able to use in the near future, and already are. Um, and then the other interesting thing is building and forestry collaboration, which is something very new, where architects are starting to work with the, the folks pulling trees out of the woods and actually um, making the products, because as we do that and start to understand the very fundamentals of the forest and how products are made, we have this beautiful sort of cascade of people and communities that are ultimately influenced by the benefit of the forest and the benefit of building and forestry. So these in, in wood products. And that's important. But we also need to move from suburban to urban. And this is what people think of when they think of wood buildings. These are great buildings, but they don't go big and they're not going to be able to go big. And so instead of moving to heavy timber, we're moving one step beyond into mass timber. This building's in British Columbia. It's a building my firm designed, and it's only eight stories tall. And truthfully, when we designed it, my engineer always kicks me when I say it, we didn't even break a sweat making an all wood building at eight stories tall. Even though codes weren't allowed to do this, we, we had a special exemption to the code to demonstrate that it could be possible. And this is what the USDA's grant is gonna allow for the, two, the project in Portland, the project in New York, and why it's so important. Because these technologies are quite different. It's gonna take time for people to understand them. But the results are incredibly beautiful. They're buildings that people want to be in. They're buildings that are durable, they're safe. Uh, this building, everything after we left the concrete in the ground is wood from there up. So everything you see, the structure is made in mass timber panels. And here, this project's already been mentioned here in the States. Um, we're doing a project in Minneapolis with Heinz that's seven stories tall, all in nail laminated timber. Um, the T3 project, which again, we expect to see many, many more of these projects starting to come about. So it's coming. These numbers that you see on the screen, 18, 14, 24, these are the number of stories of projects already proposed around North America and around the world today. And many of those bigger numbers are not happening here in North America. Uh, we're gonna see 18 stories in, in Vancouver so shortly but we've got time, we need to catch up. So I'll show you some projects. This is a recent project called LCT in Austria. It's a project in Zurich that's tall and in wood. Um, quite interesting by a Japanese architect. This is a project in London. London has many new tall wood buildings happening and at various heights, but increasingly taller and taller. Um, this is in Sweden. Um, we're currently doing a tall, a tall wood book that'll sort of tell the story of these. But where we're going is this. It's, as I said, when we designed that Wood Innovation Design Center building, the eight-story building I showed you, we didn't really break a sweat. It's not hard technically to do this. It's hard to advance people's imagination of what's possible. And that's really the trick of what we're up to, is how do we convince people that this is possible? Well, part of it is these demonstration projects. And as we go higher and higher and higher, the taller it is, the easier it is for people to really get comfortable with heights like 12 stories and 15 stories. And so we've designed 35 stories in Paris. Um, 
that uh, unfortunately is not going to be built, but we went through this exercise and proposed it to the city of Paris as part of their Reinvente Paris uh, project, which is about really innovation. Um, and although this project is not going to be built, it's not because it's wood, it's really just because Paris wasn't ready for another tall building. Um, and so it, although it's not going to be built, um, we're quite confident that if not here, somewhere again, and we'll have another opportunity beyond Paris. Um, to kind of underscore as I wrap up here, the point that this is starting to happen everywhere in the world and that it's an incredibly important thing for the United States to become a leader in the innovation and the technology and the education around advanced wood products and advanced wood buildings. It's an incredible opportunity uh, on so many levels for the United States. Um, we ran a competition recently um, this summer uh, through my school that I run called DBR and through the United Nations FAO, who are responsible for forestry, called tree housing. And it was for a tall wood building in Africa, in South Africa. And we had 250 architects from around the world submit their ideas to build tall wood buildings from 60 different countries of the world participated in this exercise. It said to me a couple of things. One is the ideas were brilliant, but more importantly, it said this idea is here to stay. It's growing very quickly, and it's time for different nations to be competing around what they can achieve, how they can transform the built environment, how they can lead in innovation, and lead by providing great products for these new buildings. Because the Empire State Building in wood is possible. Will we build it? Who knows? If it ever gets built, it's going to be built in America. I think we all know that. Um, and I guess what we dream of is someday we're going to go from looking at construction sites like this to this and from this to this. <laughs> and I, I love this quote, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they will never sit in. Is that is the essence of what we all do. We put our ideas out there and we know that some of them will be realized in our time and some will be realized by the next time, but it's time now. And uh, the acorn's the beginning, thanks. Thank you, Michael. Great presentation. Moving on. Building with wood has many environmental benefits. Carbon sequestration and offsetting use of more carbon intensive products are just two of them. We are pleased to have speaking to you today on this Dr. Jim Boyer, a consultant with Dovetail Partners and president of Boyer and Associates, a firm focused on helping organizations improve their environmental performance. Additionally, Dr. Boyer is Professor Emeritus at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering and elected fellow of the International Academy of Wood Science. Jim. Okay, thank you and good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk on, on one kind of narrow piece of this, but it's an important piece of not only tall wood buildings, but, but wood construction in general. And I'm going to talk about environmental implications, but I'm also going to focus a little bit on carbon. So in brief, what I'm going to talk about in just the next few minutes, uh, a few words about the, the process of wood formation, uh, do a little bit of, of comparison, materials comparisons, I'm even going to talk about forest trends. Uh, and, and I would say that some of you in this room that even know maybe a lot about forest, there might be a surprising uh, thing or two in, in really looking at forest trends. Um, talk about retention of forest, something that the chief has, has talked about already. Um, we, we've kind of talked around it, but, but let's talk about it for just a minute. We've got a whole bunch of trees out there in the landscape, billions of them actually, and on a daily basis they're capturing carbon dioxide from the air and releasing oxygen. And the part we sometimes forget about is this process of photosynthesis produces sugars in the leaves, and those sugars move down the tree through the inner bark. And those sugars become incorporated in making a material that we all commonly know as wood. Um, it's a process that's taking place on a daily basis. And at a time when mankind is really spending billions of dollars and fervently looking for a way to better use solar energy, this is all happening out there in the landscape, fueled by solar energy. 
Solar energy is producing a material that's abundant, renewable, and incredibly uh, useful. Now because of this, we get this basic material wood, which we, which we all know can be used in its basic form simply by shaping it, and it's incredibly useful even in that form. But it takes relatively little additional energy to convert wood into useful product. It's produced by solar energy. That's where most of the energy input is into this material. Now, the sugars that go in to produce wood, those are carbon-based sugars, and wood is very largely carbon. Dry wood, if you do a chemical analysis of the wood, you get something like this. Carbon content of wood is around 50%. It varies between about 47, 53%. Essentially, half the weight of wood is carbon. So this podium I'm standing at, the doors over here, or the supports you see around the room, half of the weight of those is carbon. Wood stores an incredible amount of carbon. If you think of the house you live in, uh, your neighborhood, there's a great deal of carbon. We can, uh, as, a, as a life cycle assessment person, I look at that as a carbon pool. Neighborhoods are carbon pools all across the landscape. And if all this weren't amazing enough, trees and the wood they produce are renewable. Now let's talk a little bit about forests. The chief has talked a bit about this, but let's get into the weeds a little bit further. We cleared a lot of land early in our history um, as we cleared land to make room for agriculture. But in the early part of the last century, what happened was there was a confluence of things, but mechanization came along and replaced draft animals. So we didn't need as much pasture land. So some of that began to revert back to, to forests. We had the Forest Service came into being early in the, in the 1900s. The practice of forestry came to the United States from Germany. And forestry schools, the first ones were, were created. I'm from the University of Minnesota, got a PhD. We were one of the first forestry schools in the United States. A number of things came together and what happened was the amount of forest land stabilized even as the population continued to grow. We have more forest land today than we had in the early 1900s. And in the last several decades, we've even increased the extent of forest coverage. In addition to that, the growth of forests exceeds rem rem removals. If you look back to 1920, 1930, we were harvesting more than we were growing. But since that time, we have good data since 1952, but probably back even to the early 1930s, growth has exceeded harvest. And not only that, in each survey period, notice that growth is exceeding removals by a greater and greater amount. As a result of that, standing timber inventory is growing. So the extent of forest is growing, the amount of timber that's on the land is increasing as well. And if we look at carbon that's stored in the trees, above ground, below ground, carbon mass is increasing as well. Now, all of this is happening in a country that's the largest user of forest products in the world. And if you look at our history and use of wood products, look since the mid-1960s, the right-hand side of that graphic, um, our use of wood products has exploded over that four, four and a half decade period. And yet, our forests have increased in extent, they've increased in standing volume, and forests are renewable. It remarkably demonstrates that reality. Now let's change subject a little bit and get into materials comparisons. I'm a life cycle assessment specialist, um, so we're getting in this area I, I spend a lot of time thinking about. But we'll look at basic materials, assemblies, and structures. So it's been mentioned, Michael Green mentioned, that our basic structural materials are wood, steel, and concrete. So let's look a little bit at these materials. This is a, a, a graphic of carbon emitted manufacture. And if you look at the right hand column, this is total process emissions, million tons of carbon emissions per, per uh, metric tons of carbon emissions per metric ton of product. And if we look at the top numbers there, the emissions of carbon per material are about the same for cement and for, for concrete products as they are for wood on a mass basis. Now we're gonna talk about, about actually building things in just a minute. Here is steel. The first number is recycled steel, which you see that number is about seven times as great as what you see in the, in the upper part of the chart. If you're looking at virgin steel, a number that's three times greater again than that. And 
steel that's used on the job is what percent recycled? Light frame steel is about 30%, and steel overall is about 60%. You'll see some numbers floated that are higher than that, but about 60%. So if you start comparing things, you're looking at a number that's seven to greater uh, amount of carbon on a mass basis, right? But of course you don't use, oh, oh and the last thing on here is, is um, molded plastic, which is a, a uh, proxy for, for vinyl. And you can see that's a very high number in terms of carbon emission. All right, but we don't use equal mass of materials when we start building things. So what happens when we actually start building, say, for example, walls? Well, here are two comparisons. The bottom part of that graphic looks at just basic building materials. So we'll compare a, a killed dried wood stud with a steel stud, which is functionally equivalent. You'd use it in the same way. And then compare that to concrete block. And we're comparing here kilograms of CO2 per square foot of wall. So we got functionally equivalent things, OK? Along the center there where that arrow is is a zero line. You see the zero line. And what that zero line tell you, that everything to the left of that line is net negative carbon emissions. Everything to the right is carbon emission. So notice the difference on the bottom between a kill dried stud, a steel stud, and a concrete block stud, uh, wall. It's a huge difference in carbon, net carbon emissions. If we put those walls together like you put together an exterior wall at the top, uh, a wood wall with oriented strand board sheathing and then vinyl siding on the side of that, compare that to a steel stud wall with OSB with vinyl on the outside, in other words, functionally identical, uh, functionally equivalent walls, look at the difference in emissions, and then look at what happens if you build of concrete. Huge differences in net emissions. Okay. What happens if we start building entire buildings? What if we use a life cycle assessment to really look at what's happening in the building? And I'll mention the life cycle assessment very briefly. What you do is you look at every component of a building, every nail, every screw, every component that's in there. You track it all the way back through its life cycle to raw material extraction. If you're collecting materials for recycling, whatever it is, you look at all of the inputs, uh, energy and water, basic raw materials. And then you look at outputs, uh, products, co-products, emissions, effluents, and waste, okay? And you consider all stages in production, disposal, and so on. That's what life cycle is all about. So what happens then if you take this analysis, analysis like this, and you compare, for example, two things like this, a steel stud wall and a, a wood wall, non-load bearing. We'll make it a simple comparison. Well, if we com Compare that using life cycle assessment, we find a threefold difference in energy consumption in those two walls. If we start looking at emissions, things like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, and trioxide, and so on, notice that there's a considerable, let's, let's call it a penalty in this case, for choosing steel as the material of choice in this kind of project. And if we get further into the weeds and looking at different kind of emissions, cyanide, phenols, ammonia, and so on, we see emissions differences on the order of 40, 39, 40, 41 times. Huge differences in favor of wood. Now what I'm gonna show you now is uh, two projects that were analyzed extensively. And these projects are not in the United States. As Michael Grimm pointed out, a, a lot of activity has taken place in Europe over the years, a long enough period of time in which scientists have been able to go in and look at these projects in depth and see what the implications were. We got two four-story apartment buildings. They're functionally equivalent. Each contains 16 apartments, around 13,000 square feet. The first building that you see on the left there was designed and built in wood, and then a life cycle assessment was done of all environmental impacts. The second building, the one on the right, identical, built in concrete, but it was not actually built. Uh, a lot of buildings are built in concrete, so it was very well known what the inputs are. That building was designed and built and again, uh, assessed using life cycle assessment. So here's the two buildings, wood and concrete. Uh, Takeaway here is notice that the wood building contains quite a bit of concrete because the foundation of this building is concrete. Notice that the concrete building contains some wood. The roof of that building is wood. Uh, uh, the roof of the building is, is wood, <coughs> as, as many buildings are in Europe. All right, so if you, if you start analyzing this building from life cycle assessment, total energy consumed, 22% lower in the wood frame building. Fossil fuel use materials production, 24% lower in the wood building. Emissions from cement reactions, 81% greater in the concrete building. 
And if, if you're wondering what emission from a cement reaction is, remember in making cement, the, the active ingredient in concrete, you take calcium carbonate, put it at a lime kiln at high temperature, and you get calcium oxide. Calcium carbonate, calcium oxide, you get a massive release of carbon dioxide. And it doesn't make any difference how energy efficient you are in a lime kiln, you get a massive output of CO2. Long-term storage of carbon, uh, notice the 43% greater in the wood building, and this analysis assumes you get some carbon storage in concrete, slowly uh, regain of, of carbon over time. Uh, and then finally, avoided emissions due to displacement of fossil fuels, much lower, uh, or, or much higher in the wood building, much lower uh, fossil fuel emissions. And that comes from the fact that wood products in the United States are very largely, production of those are fueled using biofuels or wood residues. Key findings from the study, the average greenhouse, green, greenhouse gas mitigation is two to three times better for a wood uh, building than the concrete building, better over no matter what uh, life cycle you use for the building. The last uh, study I'll show you is the Vexure uh, Wooden City in Sweden. Uh, this was initiated in, in 1996, and actually this is not the last project, this is a continuation of what I just showed you. Um, what happened as a result of the study I just showed you is the city of Vector took those results and decided to build a fossil fuel free city. And so they took that basic research result and began building buildings like this. There are now a number of these in Vector. Um, here's here's the, the second study I'll show you. This is a life cycle assessment of the mid-rise office building. This is laminated timber, cross laminated timber versus reinforced concrete. In this particular study, and it's already been explained to you what, what CLT is, so cross laminated timber and glue laminated timber. Uh, this is an existing building in Burnaby, British Columbia, 153,000 square feet constructed in 2009. Uh, five stories, three levels of underground parking, cast in place, concrete re reinforced structural frame. So two buildings, the reinforced concrete building in this case is the one that was built. The CLT building was virtually built, and both were analyzed using uh, LCA. So, a little bit about the uh, about the construction, but in any case, functionally equivalent buildings, one of wood and one of concrete. Here are the results of that study in, in LCA. The, the lower the impact factor, the better the results. So the green in this graphic is CLT. The, the yellow lines represent reinforced concrete. You notice that wood is lower in every single category except for the last one, which I'll touch on in just a minute. But notice global warming potential. The wood building, one-fourth the global warming potential of the reinforced concrete. I'll touch on one more, two more subjects, but, but one more having to do with durability. I talk to a lot of audiences, and I, I see people in the audience, and the question of durability will come up, and people will say, yeah, but how long does a wooden building last anyway? There's a perception out there among a lot of people that build, wooden buildings don't last very long. There's only been one definitive study done of this that I'm aware of, and it was done here in the United States. And the conclusion of that study, in looking at quite a number of structures that were actually built, torn down, and, and the question was, well, why were they torn down, and so on and so on, there's no meaning relationship, no meaningful relationship between the type of structural material and average service life. And we're talking about mass timber here and not simply about mass beams, but this is the Butler Building in Minneapolis where I live. This building is the block from where I work. Built in 1906, 500,000 square feet, eight stories, and this building is as sound as the day it was built. Uh, wood buildings are durable for the long term. There's no difference in their performance. And the final subject I'll touch on is wood demand uh, keeping land and forest. Chief Tidwell talked about this a bit. <coughs> Let me talk it, about it just a little bit more. Studies have been done, and I'll, I'll put this one up right away. Um, this was done by, a uh, study done by Peter Entz. What he did was look at deforestation around the world, and he looked at what was going on in these different regions and so forth. And he concluded that those regions that have the highest consumption of forest products. The greatest amount of industrial activity around forests are precisely those nations that have the most stable forest cover and the most robust uh, forests. Another study looked at uh, increasing forest land in the United States. I mentioned earlier we've had increasing forest land over about three decades. 
The, the rise in, in timber net returns was the most important factor driving the increase in forest areas between 1982 and 1997. If forest owners, private forest owners who produce 90% of the timber used in the United States today uh, that come off uh, lands in the United States, if those owners do not have markets for their wood products, that land is not necessarily going to remain in forests. This is a report out of the U.S. Forest Service that concluded that pressure to convert forest land to non-forest uses is the primary threat to maintaining long-term forest carbon stocks and to maintaining forests in general. So just in summary, uh, maximizing the use of wood in buildings where such use makes sense in the wild by code is technically feasible. It would help us reduce our U.S. energy consumption and carbon emissions, increase economic value of working forest lands, increase forest sector and rural incomes, provide incentives for maintaining the extent, vitality, and health of forests. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Concluding the panel today, we'll now hear from Kathleen Sims, Vice President of Government Affairs at Plum Creek. In this position, Kat oversees Plum Creek's legislative goals and federal and state policy initiatives. Under her leadership, Plum Creek recently produced its first sustainability report. Up to now, you've been hearing from our panelists about the many benefits of building with wood. We've asked Kat today to help connect the dots by taking a look at what some cities are doing to lead this revolution and what the pathway has been for communities to welcome modern tall wood buildings. Kat? Thanks, Bob, and good afternoon, everyone. I've had the pleasure of hearing a number of our panelists speak at different times. And nearly universally following their remarks, someone from the audience asked a variation of one of the following questions. Well, what do we do now? What's the path forward? How do I help? From my perspective, these are excellent questions. I think they speak universally to our excitement for this opportunity. I think also they speak to the complexity of the challenge and perhaps also a bit to the power of inertia. What do we do now? What's the path forward? And how do we help? Well, thought leadership will be critical. We need more thought leaders in government, architecture, engineering, construction, R&D, manufacturing. And those thought leaders need our support to build momentum. What does thought leadership look like? Well, the USDA is a great example. Secretary Vilsack has been a real champion for building with wood. Some examples of USDA leadership include the tall wood building competition that we heard about today. They also include the Sustainable Wood Construction Training Program, which includes a $1 million investment from the Forest Service and is in partnership with Woodworks. The USDA has also made investments in research and technological support, like through the Forest Products Lab. We have some thought leaders in Congress as well. Congressman Derek Kilmer has been a champion. He authored legislation directing the Department of Defense to collaborate with USDA on how to use CLT and tall wood construction. He's also worked as a thought leader convener. He's brought together academic, environmental, and industry leaders to talk about how CLT manufacturing can create new economic opportunities for rural communities that have been left behind in the economic recovery. Of course, pioneering architects and engineers, they're changing the way that people think about wood. Michael Green has been a leader in educating communities and policymakers on the benefits of building with wood. Other architects like Joe Mayo and Susan Jones are also making inroads here. And of course, Woodworks, they've been indispensable in helping to translate some of the technical research so that it's useful and accessible to architects, engineers, and developers 
who want to do new and innovative things with wood. So my first suggestion is be a thought leader or support a thought leader. In addition to thought leadership, we need more funding to accelerate the rate of tall wood building research and code recognition. As you've already heard today, international research clearly supports the conclusion that mass timber technology is safe and resilient. But US research must be funded and completed to accelerate acceptance of this technology in the US. Universities and academics are leading the way, and I want to give a shout out to Clemson University that's really doing great work on this. Because tall wood building construction is new to the US, its recognition is limited in US building codes. Before new investment in manufacturing will really take off, these new wood construction systems need to be widely recognized in building codes. And thanks goes to the American Wood Council, who's been leading the push for the regulatory acceptance of wood and wood products. So in addition to thought leadership and funding for research and code recognition, we also need widespread recognition that the building material choices we make today are going to make a big difference in our rural economies and our urban environments. Dovetail has been a leader in researching the carbon profile of wood and helping to educate others about the carbon benefits of building with wood. So a big thank you should go out to all of our thought leaders here today. But that begs the question, what is our path forward? Well, I don't have the precise formula for that, but I would like to talk to you about some of the ingredients. And in order to do that, I'd like to share with you the Oregon story. While we happen to be sitting together in Washington, DC, significant momentum for this effort is building at the state and local levels, especially in Oregon. As you might guess, Oregon has a really interesting mix of both urban centers and vast forests. And urban also has a lot of rural communities that have been left behind in the economic recovery. In many ways, Oregon mirrors other major timber producing states, states like Georgia, Florida, Washington, and Minnesota, just to name a few. But here's what sets Oregon apart. A coalition of Oregon business and government leaders have come together and really recognize the opportunity for mass timber construction in their state. They've also realized that to advance this new opportunity, there need to be breakthroughs across a spectrum of disciplines, manufacturing, demand creation, and government support. And through their dedication and collaboration, this is exactly what's happening and they are radically moving the needle. The Building Code Division in Oregon is looking for new ways to accommodate wood construction, which in turn is encouraging CLT construction. In January of this year, Oregon State University announced a new initiative called the Forest Science Complex Initiative. This is gonna be a new research facility. It's gonna be both built from and dedicated to developing new wood construction technologies, including CLT. Now, incidentally, a number of forest products industry members have really reached out to support this effort, and not just in Oregon. In Oregon, of course, but also in California and in Washington. In addition to the forest science complex, Oregon State University and the University of Oregon, known to some of us as cross state rivals, the beavers and the ducks, they're collaborating. They've joined forces to launch the National Center for Advanced Wood Products Manufacturing and Design. Now that's a mouthful. Um, it's gonna be housed at the OSU College of Forestry and the center is gonna bring together multidisciplinary work, leaders in architecture, wood science, engineering, and of course, forestry. And the center will develop innovative wood products and components of wood products that can be built, yes, in Oregon. 
So let's be clear, this initiative is two cross-state rival universities working together, not just with their forestry schools, but pulling in their engineering schools, their architecture schools, and their forestry programs. This is all to build innovations in wood, and it's really incredible. In April, Oregon passed a law creating the Pacific Northwest Manufacturing Partnership. The PNMP was formed in response to a federal initiative called the Investing in Manufacturing Communities Partnership. PNMP's Catalyst Project is related to the commercialization and promotion of CLT in the Northwest. Of course, as we've heard today, one of the Tallwood Building Competition winners is in Oregon, and there's another project outside of that competition being built of CLT in Oregon. And in September, just last month, it was very exciting to see that a Riddle Oregon lumber mill is the first U.S. mill certified to produce building-ready CLT panels. Well, this is what I'll say. Kate Brown has been very supportive of tall wood buildings, and she's positioning the state to be a real leader, both in manufacturing of and building with CLT. To my knowledge, the level of collaboration that's happening in Oregon isn't happening anywhere else in the US. But happily, Oregon is not alone, and there is collaboration and progress in other communities. In 2012, Seattle approved CLT for use in its building code, and yesterday and today, uh, groups are convening together in Seattle around the theme, Building for a Sustainable Future. Their goal is building momentum and collaboration in Washington State to make CLT manufacturing and tall wood building construction in Washington a reality. In Minneapolis, of course, Heinz is planning for the new T3 building, and they'll be using um, wood for engineered columns, beams, and floor joists. And earlier this year in Huntsville, Alabama, Len Lease built a new four-story hotel on Redstone Arsenal. This is using CLT. Certainly, there are other examples across the US that I'm not aware of, and it would be remiss for me not to acknowledge all of the great work that's being done in Europe, Australia, and in Canada. So, what is the path forward? My advice is threefold. First of all, be collaborative. Nobody can do this alone. This effort requires more than just public policy or public servant leadership. It requires the collaborative work of developers, architects, businesses, academia, and government to turn the vision of tall wood building into a reality. Second of all, be courageous. The groups that I've just spoken about are taking what initially seemed impossible and making it possible. And while Oregon is leading the way domestically, there is no reason that states and localities all over the US can't do the same. Third, be creative. Billions of people around the world need new structures in which to live and work. More than ever in history, we're seeing a move to more urban-centered environments, and rural communities are being left behind. Tallwood buildings can support our critical rural communities while we are building the cities of the future. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Um, we've had some excellent presentations, and I hope uh, now that it spurs some good discussion. Uh, we'll momentarily open the floor to the people here in the room for Q&A. Um, we don't have that capability for the people uh, uh, who are watching uh, via the webcast, but because we do have those people, we ask that if you're going to ask a question, just raise your hand, we'll acknowledge you. We have two people with microphones who will bring you the microphone. Um, when, when they do that, uh, please just state your name, your affiliation, and then ask your question. So while you're thinking of burning questions to ask, uh, I'll start off with the first one. I'll uh, ask, um, how have you overcome misperceptions or concerns when building with wood? 
Any specific examples of when you saw the proverbial light bulb come on for someone? And Michael, perhaps we could start with you. Sure. Um, there, there are a whole list of questions that come at us typically, and certainly people's first question is always about fire, and how did these buildings perform in fire, and how is it possible that um, they work? And you know, there's a couple of things I typically say. One is I ask them if they live in a wood house, and often they do, and, and then they sort of start thinking, you know, of course, of course wood is all around us, and it doesn't burn down, um, because we have proper codes that protect buildings. But the other is to use simple analogies to remind people of how wood actually does burn. Um, the buildings we're talking about are made of very, very massive pieces of wood. And I, I really liken it to the idea if you took a log and how you try to get a lighter um, to light a log on fire. And you can't, you can't do it. It doesn't work. Um, these buildings um, are resistant to fire because they have their mass. And uh, that log analogy is a very simple way of connecting people to the story. Um, you know, the other thing I, I talk about is when a big forest fire happens naturally in the forest, the tall trees very often are left standing because they have this mass. And that's very similar to the kind of buildings we're talking about. And it helps people connect and feel, uh, you know, more comfortable with it. Um, structurally, I like to tell the story about when people think these great heights in wood and they assume they can't be strong enough. I remind them that the forest grows to 30 stories tall in America and certain parts of our forest. and. Uh, if that's true, why why can't we build that tall? Um, so you know, often it's just these um, you know reminders that everybody knows that helps them understand the buildings a bit better. Thank you. Question from the audience. Well, why don't we start with Will back there? Then we'll <laughs> to you. Sorry. Sorry. Close the microphone. Hi, Will Telegram with the Southeastern Lumber Manufacturers Association. I'm curious, uh, Kat, you spoke about building codes and the great work that's happening in Oregon right now, and you talk about how it can be applied to different localities around the country. Do you guys have specific examples where work has been, you know, advocating to just build for the, you know, to work towards codes that allow really tall wooden buildings outside of what's happening in Oregon, just more broadly across the country? First of all, um, thanks for your question, Will. The American Wood Council is probably the lead organization that's working on building codes, but what I can say is that movement is really happening at the local, oftentimes the county or city level on this work. The city of Seattle approved use of CLT in 2012, and um, they approved five or six story CLT buildings uh, based upon whether it's residential or commercial. If it's commercial, it can be six stories. But negotiation is ongoing right now about increasing those height levels for CLT in the city of Seattle. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, but that it's happening in other places as well. I just happen to live and work in Seattle, and so that's the one that I know best. Um, if Bob cares to comment on things that are happening in other local jurisdictions, that'd be, that'd be great. But I know that they're working at this at the International Building Code level. Thanks, Kat. I perhaps will just step out of my role as moderator just for a second. Uh, will the American Wood Council, as Kat referenced, has a project underway to change the uh, building codes in the, across the United States to allow taller buildings constructed of mass timber and glad to go into detail with you when we have a chance. Uh, Jane. I'm Jane Alonzo with the National Alliance of Forest Owners. Thanks so much for uh, a fantastic presentations today. I learned a lot. Um, I'm wondering if you've run into any meaningful opposition uh, to this concept, either from other building sectors like concrete or steel, or from those in the environmental community who um, may think this is a threat somehow to the sustainability of our forests. Shall I jump in on that? Sure, sure. Michael. Um, you know, I think for a long time this was, um, these early ideas of tall wood were not very threatening because it didn't, it was an early idea. And now the momentum has clearly shifted and there's a lot more focus and interest. What's important is that, I like to think of it as when, when I choose materials for a building, it's like, picking food off a menu. And, and uh, it's not so much that we want to get rid of concrete and steel, it's that we want to adjust the proportions of what we use.
systems um, to use each material where it works best. And so we want to increase the amount of wood for all these environmental benefits. And we probably want to decrease the amount of concrete and steel, but we want to very much support um, those materials where they make more sense than, than wood. And, and so it's, it, I, th I think we see it as a, you know, an adjustment, but not a competition, really. Jim. Yeah, w with respect to questions about sustainability of forests, it's, it's counterintuitive that you can help save forests by using more wood, right? And so just, just the simple forest truths that we talked about today are, are not widely known out there. Uh, and and I, think, I think we all need to work harder to make sure that, that the dynamics of the forest in North America are known. Um, the second thing, and I, and I already mentioned that today, there is a question out there about durability of wood in, for the long term. It, it's just a perception. I've talked to enough audiences of people I know it's out there. Uh, it's not true, but we need to work, you know, to, I, I actually think we need more studies in that regard, uh, more de demonstrative data to show that, you know, there, there is not a, a valid durability issue. add to that, um, Jane, we do get questions about are we going to run out of trees? And um, th to that question, I guess I would say in the last 60 years or so, and I think it was Dr. Boyer who mentioned this, we've built like 90 million homes in the U.S. In addition to building 90 million homes in the U.S., we've, surpri we've supplied um, fiber to a world-class pulp and paper industry. Um, the U.S. and Canada has. Through that whole time, in that 60-year period, we've actually increased forest cover by 50%. Well, how has that been done? It's been done through investments in civiculture. It's been done through improving seedlings and making sure that there's lower rates of mortality. It's been done through, um, you know, just better thinnings and, and better planning. And all of the studies show, as Dr. Boyer said, that the more um, valuable uses there are for trees, the more that forest landowners actually invest in, in growing robust and healthy forests. And so to those people who wonder, are we gonna run out of trees? I think that the evidence points to know that sustainability won't be a problem. For those who wonder about that, I guess I would also point to sustainability certification and the very robust laws and BMPs that we have in the U.S. to ensure that that, in fact, won't happen. Chief. I'd just like to add a little to this, that it's important for us to have the dialogue, the discussion in the United States to be able to address some of these concerns. But one of the key benefits from CLTs and this mass timber products is it gives us economic beneficial use of this small diameter residual material that needs to be removed from so many of our forests. And in the past, we used to spend a lot of time piling it and burning it and just releasing more emissions versus taking that material now and being able to put it into not only a very usable product, but it also sequesters carbon. So for those that are really concerned about you know the environment it's something everyone needs to understand this is an incredible benefit about a, a use of a product that we used to spend a lot of money to get rid of to be able to manage and restore our forests now we can actually use it to help cover the costs to restore and maintain our forests i think if we can get to that point where folks understand this connection and yes we need to continue to how we're going to do it and where we're going to do it but if we can get over that, that one question, I think this is where we can continue to build more and more support. And today that I can easily say that there is less controversy, less conflict about the importance of managing forests today than any time throughout my career. And it's because we've taken the time to be able to sit down and have the discussions. Also to have the science to be able to, to show and also at our Forest Products Lab up in Madison, Wisconsin. And we take people through there and we can show them how we can take the small diameter material and create a cross-laminated timber. And then to be able to put it through the test to show that it's resistant to flame, resistant to heat, and it has incredible strength 
you know, those are the demonstrations that really help. And so once again, it's our science and it's our data. And if we can bring that together with having taken the time to have the dialogue, the discussions, I think we can continue to be able to move forward and let and help more and more people really understand the benefits of building with wood and especially to be able to expand into this new market. Great. Other questions from the audience? Jack? Question of and a comment too. I'm, Name? I'm, name's Jack Jordan with Jordan Lumber in North Carolina. Uh, I saw the, the thing about the acorn and the not getting to sit under the, sheep, uh, the shade tree. I think I go through that every year because we plant over a million trees on our 72,000 acres of land as we cut 2,000 acres a year, thin 2,000 acres a year. We use genetically improved seedlings. We use fertilization. We do anything to make sure that it grows in a, in a good manner and a great product, much, much straighter trees, great limb angle, things like that that's made such a difference. It's so great for me to hear what you guys are saying because it's what we live every day in trying to have a great healthy forest that we can get a good productive product off of and make a real good living. And then we're in rural America, a town of 1,200 people, and we're employing around 350 people at our mill. So it's, uh, you know, it's not just Oregon, and I'm, I'm great, it's glad to hear what's happening in Oregon, and I want to see that replicated ac across our country. And we, we have to get our education groups together and talk so that we're not duplicating what they're doing, but we're doing something that can complement what they're doing. So uh, again, I thank you today. And I had a question about the seven-story building. Uh, is that building easily expanded above that without really changing much of the design? Um, the the seven-story in Minneapolis that we're doing T3, it's uh, it's under construction. Um, it could be, it probably could add more floors to it. I don't know how many. It's usually governed by how we design the foundation. Um, but technically, we could go much higher with that same technique. Absolutely, absolutely, it's a big building. Okay, uh, other questions? Nadine. Thanks. I'm Nadine Block with the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and first of all, thank you to this panel. It was excellent. A couple of the cu questions and comments already so far have touched on, on this, but you know, we've, we're kind of seeing a perfect storm in a good way come together in terms of technologies that are allowing us to build uh, taller and, and bigger wood buildings. Um, we're seeing uh, some, a lot of work in the education realm, especially reaching out to architects and builders. We're seeing changes in building codes. Um, and so obviously we've seen some great advancements and yet there's more to do. And so the question I'll have, and I'll maybe start with Michael, but others may want to chime in is, d you know, despite all this, they're, they're, we, we want to see more. And so who, you know, who do you think it's most critical to reach out to? Is it the builder and architect community to, to maybe change more people's mindsets? Um, and if so, you know, you talked a little bit about some of those barriers like fire. What, what else, where would we need to focus to help um, overcome some of the barriers and really help people embrace this idea even more? Okay, um, there's, I, I think there's a number of layers of challenges that we're facing. One is that the building industry is generally conservative. So new ideas, when they come about, there's, you know, it's a retooling of that industry that has to happen. And so um, part of that is, is educating more builders to be able to build these buildings, more certainly more designers, as we've talked about, to be able to design them. Um, but fundamentally, the marketplace also wants them to be cost competitive buildings. And, and it's a chicken and egg scenario where um, the demand and the supply have to align. Um, we don't have enough competition in the market yet here in North America. Um, these buildings absolutely will be not only cost competitive, but I think more affordable in the long run, but it's gonna take us time to get there. And um, that means um, really supporting and encouraging um, new advanced wood products companies to come on board is, a, I think, a very important part of this. Um, and, and then also, you know, once um, we have enough product and architects are uh, in particular out there selling these ideas to their clients, it's also about helping them um, connect with the consumer and, and really sort of go through the process of checking the boxes so that the consumer out there looking to build a commercial building or a residential building understands that they're safe, understands there's huge environmental benefits, 
Um, and not only that, ultimately understands these, these can be healthier buildings to live in and much more attractive buildings to live in if they're, if they're done well. So I think really connecting with consumers is one of the next steps that needs to happen. Jim. Yeah, and I'd just like to add, uh, it's been mentioned already, but, but educating code officials I think is really important. And, and a good example I think is the Redstone Project, Redstone Arsenal Project in Alabama, it was mentioned earlier. Um, we had a number of conversations with those folks because we want to do a life cycle assessment of that project. And, and in the end, we decided it wasn't a good candidate. And the reason was, you know, they built a COT building, but the code official was unfamiliar with the technology. And so he decided, he, they decided that there had to be a lot of redundancy built into the building. So it was a COT building, only four stories that needed to be sprinklered. Okay, but then it needed to have uh, gypsum, cheap rock put on all of the walls, you know, as, a, as another layer of redundancy. Uh, and by the time they got all finished, they said, well, actually this building was way more expensive than if they'd done it the traditional way. Uh, so it's an example of where, you know, the, the, the army decided to do this, but the, the code people they were working with just weren't in step with, with where they wanted to go. Uh, another thing I'd mentioned, and, and Michael mentioned it, uh, cost information on these kind of buildings is really important. Uh, one of the things we have identified through a, a life cycle assessment task group that's working uh, is that we need life cycle cost assessment data, LCCA. The military actually invented LCCA, and there's very little LCCA CCA data out there for wood. We need LCCA studies to be done and published, uh, certainly for military use, and, and other people are using that as well. Michael might have a comment on that also. It's, um, I think that's a, that's a really good point. The, um, you know, the, the developer industry right now is, is, um, is the other really critical part. And when we talk about construction um, costs, they're used to only thinking about the hard costs of construction, what the building itself costs. These buildings become cost competitive because they're very fast to build. And that's not a way we talk about the cost of a building. And so there's a kind of retraining about the overall and the discussion of how we talk about costs that needs to include time and the, what we call the soft costs of construction as well as the hard costs to really make it comparative with other building types. Um, that's, a, that's a tricky change that's still, um, I'm, I'm not really sure how we're gonna make that change, but that has to happen in order for developers to really accept this as a cost competitive solution. There's a, there's a really amazing quality of building one of these buildings that I, truthfully, I didn't really appreciate until I started doing it, and that's that they're very quiet to build. And quiet matters. When we're talking about really densifying our, our urban environments, um, we've got construction across the street and the sounds that are interrupting this room. Um, imagine a building that goes up with just cordless drills, which is what it, what it takes to build one of these buildings. It's not huge hammering or concrete trucks backing up and beeping at you all day long over and over and over. They actually go together very quickly and very quietly, which is this sort of really beautiful sort of additional benefit. Um, and, and I think in many ways that subtle um, benefit is much like the cost benefits are gonna take time for people to get used to and understand the, the real value of. Kathy, do you have a comment? Yeah, a few quick comments about that. Um, first of all, business in general is risk averse. And so when you introduce a, a whole new way of building and designing buildings, um, companies that are used to building dozens of buildings or maybe even hundreds of buildings a year out of concrete and steel, um, they, they certainly see that you're introducing an element of risk or uncertainty in their world when you suggest changing the materials. And so, um, the first couple buildings for a, a new company doing this are the challenge and being able to slowly introduce that new idea and get them comfortable with what their risk paradigm is there is important. Um, second of all, most of these companies that are building commercial buildings um, bid out all of their materials and their suppliers to three different firms. And right now there aren't three different US firms producing um, construction grade CLT, building grade CLT. And so you're diminishing their ability to get a competitive bid when you introduce CLT into the mix. 
um, which then creates the chicken and the egg issue, which Michael raised. Um, until building codes widely accept use of CLT in buildings, companies are gonna be reluctant to make the capital investment into actually producing a CLT manufacturing facility. So I think that there probably needs to be some government supported, initially government supported um, demand pull, probably through government buildings or Department of Defense buildings or something of that nature in order to create enough certainty of demand that the manufacturing will follow. Can I have one more thing? The, the way um, I often look at it is um, a little bit like the software industry, is that the, the developers and those interested in building these buildings are the early adopters. These are the people that, um, you know, that they're probably not turning out a thousand buildings a year. They're probably um, young and energetic and looking to really make their mark in the world with their company. They're, the kinds of um, people coming into it really are bringing this new fresh life into, into the conversation. They're willing to adopt some, some uh, I guess, accept a higher level of risk as they do so. Um, and, and that seems to be a really positive thing. Turning that into, from the early adopters into the mainstream is, is kind of where we need to get to. Um, but it's gonna take these first projects, and I think you're right, and building for the, for the military is a great example, being able to really run through case studies with, for, to, to prove out costs in particular will be incredibly helpful and beneficial. Um, you know, certainly, I, if I could speak a little bit to what Canada did, because Canada is a little bit ahead in this conversation, they, um, they, uh, they really saw the benefit of seeding some, of, uh, some funds into some of the plants that are actually making the CLT. Um, now, I, I don't know that that's going to be needed because I think the demand's really starting to come and the Oregon company that isn't making CLT is doing very, is starting to get a lot of orders already. But um, really, um, really this drive for manufacturing and, and getting some, um, you know, convincing people that there's a demand, I think we may be almost over that hurdle. Um, and especially if the military do get involved, which makes a lot of sense. Rita Height with the American Forest Foundation and also the co-chair of the Forest Climate Working Group. Um, and we've spent a lot of time in the Forest Climate Working Group trying to think about how we can incentivize um, forest owners, forest products manufacturers, et cetera, to um, you know, produce all these carbon-friendly things that we're talking about here, um, whether it's carbon on the land or carbon in, in stored in products. Um, and, and we've seen things like President Obama's Climate Action Plan that includes strong recognition for the, the climate benefits of, of building with wood, thanks a lot to the, to the leadership of USDA and the Forest Service in, in really making that happen. But um, we, we don't seem to, to see this issue pop necessarily as we think about and, and see states starting to think about their climate policies, um, et cetera, and, and, and local communities as well. Do you think this is an issue where the public isn't fully grasping the, the carbon benefits and the climate benefits? Is there something there that, that we need to do to, to help advance um, not just the case in terms of all the things that we've laid out here, but, but really the strong case with respect to climate change and, and how forest products can help us mitigate climate change? Panelists, Jim? Well, I, honest, I honestly think that the public is, you know, the public's getting the kids to soccer and, you know, there's just a million things we're worried about, a rock and all kinds of other things. And, and carbon is, yeah, it's out there. And then carbon in forests is another issue. I just think we're going to have to work really hard at this as a, as a community. Uh, we're going to, this is not something we can talk about once. And so we're done with that. You know, we can move on. I think we've got to find a way to, to, to hit this again and again and again. Uh, and, you know, what's the story? This has been described by, by someone, I don't remember who said it, but it, it's kind of the greatest story never told sort of thing. We, we've got a material that's low embodied energy. It's really low embodied fossil energy. It stores massive amounts of carbon for the long term. It's durable, renewable, produced using solar energy, and it comes from forests that are well managed. I mean, what the heck? You put all those together, it's an incredibly good story, and we're We've got more, we've got more work to do in making sure that people get that message. Saying it's easy to doing it is harder, I know. 
I, uh, I'll throw something out there. It's um, this may be more risque as, a, as an answer to this, but um, in British Columbia, um, they introduced what's called a Wood First Act, which said that public buildings should consider the use of wood products first when building a building. And there was no clear definition what that actually meant. Was that the outside or, the stru or was it the structure? There was not a lot of definition, but it was sort of saying in a community that believes in forestry that this would be an important public policy decision. Um, and I argued against it, and I said it actually should be called a carbon first policy that says that public buildings, and I think this would, to me personally would be appropriate all over the world, um, public buildings should demonstrate through example, lead by example, by saying that we should choose the lowest carbon materials in building our buildings. Schools, municipal halls, whatever, fire stations, all of our fire stations in British Columbia are building wood, by the way. Um, and in doing so, it says to all industry, if you want to compete, compete make your product lower carbon. That's in the best interest of everyone. It also happens to today benefit wood the most. Um, it's a fair policy, it's a relatively free policy, um, and it's a policy that says this is an issue that the public should be aware of and as a community we can, we can enact quite easily. So my hope is we see more carbon first policies. Thank you. Um, to my right, uh, we haven't had any questions from that side. Uh, coming up. Uh, hi, my name is Brittany Patterson. I'm with Environment and Energy Publishing. Thanks so much for holding this. A lot of really interesting stuff. Um, I guess got two questions for you. The first is, what sort of technologies do you still need to have come to fruition in order to maybe drive this forward even more, if there are any? Um, and secondly, a couple of you mentioned we all thought this was impossible. It, like you said the words impossible. Why? Why was this considered impossible up until now? I, I could touch on the impossible. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of people thought I was crazy when I first started talking about this about 10 years ago. The, um, uh, you know, I think the, the, on tall buildings, the interesting thing is really we're talking about the first new way to build tall buildings that the earth has seen in, in a century. And the shift wouldn't have happened if, I think, if we didn't all start becoming much more aware of the environmental impact and the carbon impact of, build, of the built environment. And so um, while we all recognize trying to change such an incredibly um, entrenched system of how we build might be, I think in the early days we called it impossible, um, what we are all seeing is that the time is right, the um, products are here, the technology's here, um, it's really now about shifting the public's perception of what's possible and, and shifting, um, you know, policy around codes and, and so forth. Um, but it's definitely no longer impossible. It's just, uh, it's just really exciting. Okay. I'll just comment briefly on the impossible comment. And that's that um, I, I mentioned also early in my remarks that inertia is a powerful force. And I think changing building codes um, is, is just a real challenge. It, it takes a fair amount of time and investment in research. While CLT and mass timber and tall wood buildings are being built all over the world, um, US building code adoption is such that that testing has to happen also domestically before the U.S. building codes will recognize um, tall wood buildings or mass timber buildings as safe. And so accelerating the funding and the research and the completion schedule for that research in order to use it um, with the code officials is, is something that still needs to be completed, but I believe that the technology is there and, um, you know, and the research certainly can be completed to do that. I do, uh, I think the technology is definitely there. Um, there's no question we need more data. I think the, um, the life cycle analysis is essential to be able to show that. I think it's going to take multiple um, demonstration product or projects to be able to also help. But for this to really shift, it's going to have to come from the public. The public's gonna have to say, hey, <coughs> this is an environmentally friendly, an environmentally better way to build. And so we want to see that. 
Because I think the reality, you know, for local officials to take the time to, to go through the energy um, and to make changes to code, et cetera, it's gonna have to come, I think, you know, from the publics. So we have a role to be able to provide not only the science, the technology, to have the data, and I think to find ways to um, have more demonstration products and projects. But I think it really, we need to be able to have that dialogue so that if your community was saying, hey, this is what we want, this is how we want our public buildings built, um, because we think it's a better, better way, then I think we'll really start to see the change. And Michael, going back to your, your pitch about you know, being focused on carbon and to encourage all construction to be able to be looking at how we can reduce you know, that carbon footprint, whether it is with concrete and steel, and just the, you know, combining some of the cellulosic material with, with concrete to reduce the, um, uh, the carbon footprint from just concrete. Those are the things we need to continue to have the discussion on so that we can do this together, but it's like so many things. It needs to come from the public. And then when we get there, then we're going to be able to have the sustainable demand for being able to use things like uh, cross-laminated timbers and mass timber you know, for more commercial buildings. We are getting close to our scheduled time limit. Uh, if there's one quick last question, we'll take it. Uh, Herm? I'm Furman Brody with Charles Ingham Lumber Company. Most of the developers I know, you know, while they may talk about carbon or be aware of that and all these other aesthetic things, their bottom line is money. So how, how, do, how do these buildings compare on money to the traditional building uh, that has, has been done? So the um, so we did a, in my book the case for tallwood buildings we did a study on the cost comparisons between a 20-story concrete building and a 20-story wood building and what we found is that um, you know it's it's difficult to do that costing exercise because it's not a competitive marketplace in wood yet um, but what we found is that we were still able to be almost dollar for dollar over the overall project cost the same as doing a concrete building. I live in a concrete community where they don't do a lot of tall steel buildings, they do concrete, so that's what we compared. Um, we found that these wood buildings would be about the same cost. Now, that's without a truly competitive marketplace. There's only two suppliers in North America when we did this study, and really just one supplier, so we don't have competitive pricing. As the market matures, I think without question, for two reasons, we're gonna see prices for these buildings be less expensive than steel or concrete. One is because um, you know, it's a more competitive marketplace and more people understand how to do it. The other is because, um, um, because energy prices are, are very closely associated with steel and concrete because they're high energy materials as we just saw. And, uh, and, and whereas wood is a lower energy material. Um, the demand in other nations really drives steel pricing here. Um, so, you know, I think we have a much more stable marketplace for the wood products in North America than we probably do with steel or concrete. And so I, I expect that it'll be um, ultimately, certainly less expensive. And I think you're absolutely right. This is what developers are going to need to believe in order to feel comfortable stepping into this arena. Um, some will do it because they care about the environment. Some will do it because it's new and the consumers want new and fresh ideas, and, and most will do it because it's, it's more cost effective, and, and it will be. Jim? Yeah, just, just a quick comment. I, I don't want to wade off into the political weeds, but since this is the last question of the day, I'm just going to throw this out there, and that is that from my view of the world, sooner or later, we're going to wind up doing something definitive about carbon. It probably will take the, the reform of a cap and trade initiative or maybe even a carbon tax. And if that comes about, wood is going to emerge very quickly in terms of cost in all kinds of projects. With that non-political answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll close the session today. I wanna thank all of you for coming. I wanna thank the AWC staff for putting this together. I think they've done a terrific job. And mostly I want to thank our, our panel today, uh, Chief Tom Tidwell, Michael Green, Dr. Jim Boyer, and Kat Soon for sharing their insights today. So thank you.
Um, just before you leave, uh, on the screen you'll see contact information for both the American Wood Council and Rethink Wood. Please email us if you have any additional questions. Uh, we'll be here for a few minutes if you want to just pull us aside and talk to us. Um, we'll be around, uh, and uh, thank you all for attending.